Can you go to who was Will Rogers? Will Rogers, well, for one thing, he was, when he died in 1935, he was described by Joe Robinson, the majority leader of the Senate, as uh, America's most famous private citizen and probably its most beloved private citizen, uh, which was one of the things that struck me when I started doing research for this book, how incredibly famous and popular he was at the time, and how today, uh, especially before the Broadway musical Will Rogers Follies was such a success, uh, he was more or less forgotten. When was the first time you ever thought about Will Rogers? You know, it was probably sitting in a movie theater when the ushers came around uh, sprinkling, uh, jingling the, the cups for the Will Rogers Foundation, which actually has nothing to do with him or his family. I, I, it was one of the first things I found. The, uh, the foundation uh, at it was started after his death in 35, which was such a shock. Uh, Will Rogers is known for his charitable work. This foundation started. They asked the family if they could use the name. The family said yes, and they've been going on ever since. But, you know, I really didn't know much about him at all. It, um, up until I started the book, it was, it was a sort of a, a, a name, an image of somebody throwing a rope or a lariat, and, of course, his two famous... Uh, quotations, uh, I never met a man I didn't like, and all I know is what I read in the papers. That was it. I now, I now remember the movie thing. It was just not normal for them to pass buckets around to get money in a movie theater. What was the purpose of that? Uh, well, they still do it. Um, it. It's certain periods of the year, maybe twice or three times a year, uh, the, the motion picture and entertainment industry put their support behind this foundation that collects money for uh, medical research and they allow the theaters to be used as, as fundraising venues. How did you go about finding, finding out about Will Rogers? Well, my biggest and, and best resource was a place called the Will Rogers Memorial in Claremore, Oklahoma, which was near his, his birthplace. He was actually born in Ulaga. Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, but he always claimed that Claremore was his birthplace because he said people couldn't pronounce Ulaga. Um, but at this uh, uh, Bill Rogers Memorial, which is a combination museum and uh, library, are deposited all his papers, all his letters, uh, all his notes, and he was kept voluminous notes. He was uh, an entertainer on the vaudeville stage in the Ziegfeld Follies for years and years, and he would write down comedy routines of draft after draft after draft, uh, and they're all there. Uh, when I was first contemplating writing, uh, writing the book, I, I took a trip out to Oklahoma to see what was there, and uh, was going through, there was a notebook, and I, my eye spotted it, said, uh, letters to Will Rogers from famous people. I was flipping through it, and there were letters from Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was a friend of his, Calvin Coolidge, uh, Bernard Baruch, people like that. And there was a letter from Charles Lindbergh, who it turned out was, was also a friend of his. Uh, and, it, and Will Rogers, in the 1920s, was the number one proponent of aviation in the country. He was just an incredible enthusiast. When, when he died, ironically, in an, in an airplane crash, it, it was estimated he had logged more miles than any other non any non pilot in the country anyway uh, Lindbergh had written this letter in about 1929 he said uh, uh, dear will I'm glad to see that you're riding the airlines uh, I hope you keep out of single engine planes at night and knowing how he had died this just, just came with the shock and I said and I had read other Rogers biographies this quote was not in any of them I said there's great material here uh, and the more I looked into him the more fascinating he, he became to me Maybe an odd way to do a, a interview about a book on a man's life, but let's start at at, at the end. And you've, yeah. you've got this picture right here of a single-engine plane. Uh, what year did he die, and how did he die? Well, the year was 1935, and uh, he was with a man named Wiley Post, who you might find a photo of in there as well, uh, who was one of the most famous aviators of the day, next to Lindbergh, probably the most famous. Uh, Wiley Post had established the... Uh, uh, record, not, not only record, he was the first man to fly solo around the world, uh, which was one of the greatest feats, if not the greatest, in the history of aviation to this day. Uh, he was a, a one-eyed aviator. He was known by his trademark uh, uh, eye patch. Uh, born in Oklahoma, raised in Texas, and, and Will Rogers being from Oklahoma, they had a, a bond. and They'd been friends for some years. Uh, Will Rogers, one of the things that, that, that drove his life at the time was he wrote a daily column 
that was in uh, 400 newspapers around the country, uh, including the front page of the second section of the New York Times. He was the first signed columnist the Times had, and its only columnist for a long time. Um, and he wrote a daily column of a few paragraphs and then a weekly column, a much longer uh, piece. Uh, and he had a need to fill that with material. Uh, you know, there was only so much that he could generate out of, his own, out of his own head. So he would go on trips. He loved to travel, but part of the reason to go on trips was to just gain material for his column. Uh, Wiley Post at that time was trying to uh, explore possible air links between the U.S., Alaska, and Siberia for, for air mail routes. Um, he needed funding for his trip. Will Rogers was uh, very rich, had plenty of money, loved aviation, so it, was a, it was, seemed like a perfect match. He'd always wanted to see Alaska. Uh, so they went up there and they toured the state, the, the future state, for some weeks. Uh, then finally they were going only for Will's column to uh, gather material to go up to Point Barrow, which is the northernmost point in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, there, there was a man there, an old trader and trapper, who Will thought would be great material. So they took off from Fairbanks, I believe. Um, then while it got lost, it was a, a cloudy day. Uh, he couldn't spot the coast where they were. They uh, landed beside a lagoon that was only a few miles away from Point Barrow. They found an Eskimo there, and you see some Eskimos in that photograph. Uh, he gave them directions to Point Barrow. They took off, and after the plane took off, it immediately turned around and crashed, killing both men instantly. Uh, and uh, the cause of the, of the crash is, is still not known. Uh, for sure. The two most plausible explanations are, number one, he simply ran out of gas and the engine failed. Uh, they had been traveling all day. And number two, uh, that the carburetor froze because of the conditions that maybe when they landed they turned the uh, uh, engine off and didn't allow it to warm up in time. But in any event, it crashed and both men were killed instantly. He was of what age in 1935? He was 55 years old, soon to be 56. You refer in the back and acknowledgments to a couple of his sons that cooperated with you on this. Are they still alive? Well, one is. Uh, one of the uh, sons, Will Rogers Jr., uh, died about uh, uh, a year ago, shortly before the book came out. And he was a wonderful man, a great help to me. How old, by the way, was he when he died? He was, I believe, 81. Uh, he had had a, a very career. He had been a congressman, which was ironic, considering that Will Rogers' best cracks uh, were directed at Congress, a newspaper publisher, a uh, TV personality. His son, Jim, uh, who's younger than, than, than Bill Rogers, is still alive, and he's a retired rancher in Bakersfield, California. And how much, I mean, how much time did you spend with both of them? Well, I, I had uh, very productive interviews with both, interviews of, oh, I'd say four to six hours. Um, the, the really wonderful thing that they did was they allowed me to use all of Will Rogers' published and unpublished writings, which had never been really used before in any biography, uh, especially the letters he wrote to his future wife when they were courting. Uh, in the early part of the century, just wonderful, wonderful letters. And the Rogers' sons who controlled the estate allowed me to, to use that as much as I wanted. Before you got into doing this book, what were you doing for a living? Uh, I'd been a freelance journalist. Uh, I'd been a movie critic for the Philadelphia Daily News. Uh, I'd been a staff editor at several magazines. Uh, and I felt the time had come to really write that book. And I pretty much lucked into what I thought would found out to be a perfect subject. Where do you live? I live in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. And what's happened to you since this book came out? It's been a while since the book came out. The book came out uh, approximately a year ago. Um, well, uh, since I finished the book, I uh, have started uh, teaching journalism at the University of Delaware, and that's now my full-time job, uh, which is uh, interesting to be on the other side of the coin instead of doing it, teaching it. Uh, but it's, been, but it's been very good. And I continue with my uh, freelance magazine writing, and I'm looking for another book. It's, it's tough to find one that, that matches up to this as a subject, though. On the back of this book, it says, Will Rogers for President. And it starts off by, um, and these are your words, I gather, uh, newspapers started promoting a Rogers candidacy in 1931. How? Well, uh, Will Rogers, uh, in his column, uh, had become uh, an extremely important political voice in the country. Uh, there was an article at the time that was written where, where, where in a, a Washington politician was quoted as saying, we can never have another war in this country unless Will Rogers is for it. Uh, 
he was humorous, but he was also serious. He was both. And, and there's no real uh, parallel today that I can think of. Uh, people like Molly Ivins uh, are somewhat close. Uh, he said things in a humorous way, but he had a very strong point of view. And people, uh, you know, he, he was read by 40 million people every day. They would pick up the newspaper on the breakfast table, read what Will Rogers had to say. And, you know, uh, a lot of people didn't know what they thought about an issue till they read what Will Rogers had to say. Um, and in 1928, the old humor magazine, Life, not the picture magazine, but this was a, a humor magazine, had run Will Rogers for president. It was a joke. Uh, Robert Sherwood, who was the playwright, was the editor then, and it had been his, uh, his idea to kind of poke fun at the political process, um, like Pat Paulson on the Smothers Brothers show, to run Will Rogers for president. Uh, the funny thing was that uh, so many people didn't take it as a joke. Uh, Henry Ford, for one, who was a friend of Rogers, voted in to say, hey, let's take this seriously. Rogers would be much better than, uh, than who, we ha who we have in the White House now. Uh, there wasn't any real groundswell at the time. However, 1932, the Depression had hit two years earlier. Uh, there seemed to be no way out of it. The traditional solutions seemed to be uh, not getting us anywhere. Uh, only a couple of years later, Huey Long, who was in some ways a similar figure, a populist uh, figure who wasn't from traditional politics, would, would really seriously take the idea of, of running for president. So people started saying, hey, why not Will Rogers? Uh, he was a humanitarian. He'd gone on relief tours to help out people suffering from drought. Uh, and several newspapers put him up as a candidate. Uh, the governor of Texas endorsed him. Uh, some Democratic groups in various states said, hey, he's our candidate, too. Uh, and there was a real groundswell of support. Uh, so much so that Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was the front runner and, uh, for the Democratic nomination, and with the country being in such a bad state and Herbert Hoover running again, was a pretty sure thing that Democrats would win. As I said, FDR was a longtime friend of Will Rogers. Uh, he wrote him a letter, in essence, saying, hey, don't run. Uh, you're a lifelong Democrat. Don't do anything to make the donkey chase his own tail, was the way he put it. Uh, uh, didn't say in so many words, don't run, but the meaning was clear. And, of course, he really didn't have to worry. Rogers never gave any serious thought to that. Uh, he valued his freedom. Uh, he was making uh, close to a half a million dollars a year from his column and from his movies. He was also... Uh, the biggest movie star in Hollywood in 1933. He was voted the number one box office attraction in the country by the nation's theater owners. So the president at that time you know, made much, much less than that, if, if only for the financial loss. But he just knew he was you know, wise enough and smart enough to know that he wasn't cut out to be a politician. So he never uh, gave any interest or encouragement to the idea. At the end of your introduction, you list a whole bunch of people that you say... Um are really Will Rogers and you know he'd have to be a little bit of each of these right. people and, and they include Johnny Carson, Roy Rogers, Clark Clifford, Walter Cronkite, Bill Cosby, Bob Hope, Russell Baker, H. Ross Perot, and James Reston. <laughs> Let me just test you on a couple yeah, of these things. Uh, what was he, why was he like Roy Rogers? Roy Rogers, well... Uh, Who's still alive. Yeah, Roy, and I talked to and I wrote the book, Roy Rogers is called Roy Rogers because of Will Rogers. He wasn't his son or related, but uh, do you know what Roy Rogers' real name is? Well, I read it in the book. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I won't test it. Leonard Sly. Uh, and he was in a sing group called the Sons of the Pioneers um, and met Will Rogers at a charity benefit, was so taken by him, was so uh, impressed that when he had a movie contract a few years later, they said, well, you can't be Leonard Sly. So, well, name me, Roy, uh, name me Rogers. They say, oh, okay, you'll be Leroy Rogers. Said, Leroy, I don't like it. Roy. That was, well, Roy Rogers, I stuck in there partly because of that connection, but partly because of the, the folksiness, the down-home cowboy aspect. That was a big part of Will Rogers' persona, was, was the cowboy. Uh, and when he st first started in vaudeville, and there you see the, the photograph of, of him in his vaudeville years, that was taken in 1905 when he first started in vaudeville. He was a rope spinner. He was known as uh, a cowboy rope spinner. So big well, part of it. Why did you pick this for the cover, or did you? It was not my choice, but I think it's brilliant. Uh, it's uh, one of the things I like about it was that uh, 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 the, the image that we all have of Will Rogers is, is uh, much like the one that's on the paperback edition of the book of him as a, uh, 
as an older man. Uh, that's the, the image we see again and again and again. But Will Rogers, as a young man, was this very handsome, uh, dashing figure, and it was just a, a fresh kind of image. Um, so he, but he had that cowboy persona uh, to him, and he actually was a cowboy. His father was a wealthy cattle rancher in the Indian Territory. Will worked on the ranch. He worked on a Texas ranch for six months, uh, six months on a on a cattle drive. So he came by that legitimately. Now, how was he like uh, Clark Clifford, and who was Clark Clifford? Clark Clifford was the man famous as uh, advisor friend to presidents from, I don't know whether it was Roosevelt or Truman, on to the present day. Will Rogers, unlike uh, just about any commentator, especially humorous commentator that I know of, had incredible access. He was very good friends with FDR. Uh, his best buddy in Washington was a uh, Texas congressman named John Nance Garner, who became uh, first... After Will was his friend, he became uh, Speaker of the House and then Vice President under Roosevelt. He was friends with Joe Robbins, the Majority Leader. Uh, he would come to Washington three or four times a year from his home in California, just drop his bag in Garner's office and just prowl through the corridors of Congress. Uh, yeah, there you see uh, a photo of, of Will and, and John Ance Garner on Garner's Texas ranch. He, he uh, had a ranch that, uh, that grew Soft-shell pecans, Will Rogers said. He's broken many a tooth on Garner's soft-shell pecans. So he had incredible access to the Carters of Power. And John Nance Garner, famous, uh, you know, the vice presidency's uh, warm... Like you, it's yeah, a, there's a, a there's bucket there. of a warm substance, he said it was worth. That was his, his quote. The uh, one that they often quote in newspapers is it's no better than a bucket of warm spit. Warm spit, a yeah. Degree. I, I noticed you had a, <laughs> another version of it in the book. Right, right. Uh, how about Walter Cronkite? Uh, well, I put Walter Cronkite in there, and of course in that list I was using a little hyperbole, because uh, in poll after poll, Walter Cronkite comes out as the most trusted person in America, and Rogers had that quality. That's why people supported him for president. They really felt uh, they could trust him. Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson is, and Jay Leno, I'll, I'll add to that as well. Uh, very strong parallel. Uh, Carson and Leno will come out every night had these very pointed political jokes about what happened the day before, exactly what Rogers did in his daily column. As, as I said, it came out every day. Uh, he would comment on the previous day's news with a, with a very funny point. In fact, I've seen uh, uh, Leno or Carson tell a joke. I say, hey, Rogers told that joke 70 years ago different, about a different person. You know, they're not stealing, but there's only so many ways you can make fun of a politician's finality. Can you go somewhere and find all of his jokes? Yeah, the uh, Oklahoma State University, uh, not all of his jokes, but all of his columns, all of his published writings, uh, Oklahoma State University put out a 20-volume edition, and that, to me, was an invaluable resource in doing that book. Uh, you know, What's it cost to buy that? Uh, probably $25, $30 a volume, so whatever the arithmetic is, you know, several hundred dollars uh, to, to get everyone. And a true Will Rogers fan, I guess, would have his complete works. Uh, you also list uh, James Reston and Bill Cosby and Russell Baker and H. Ross Perot. Yeah, uh, Perot I stuck in there. Well, I, I also wrote a little bit in that introduction about the similarities between uh, Rogers and Ronald Reagan. And I, when I was researching the book, I, I requested uh, former President Reagan's office for an interview because I in watching Rogers' movies uh, and newsreels, watching Ronald Reagan, there's an eerie similarity. Um, Will Rogers was famous for starting sentences with well, the word well. Uh, he tilted his head the way Reagan did. There was the same kind of uh, geniality to him. And I was convinced that he was an important figure for Reagan. And, of course, when Reagan was growing up in the 20s and 30s, Rogers was all over, t uh, no TV then, but radio movies, etc. Uh, he, he didn't grant me the interview. But also in that uh, political sphere when I was writing the book was Perot, where there were also similarities. I mean, they were from the same part of the country. Rogers, one of his political um, uh, uh, feelings was a strong distrust for Wall Street. He hated borrowing money, being in debt in any way, similar to Perot. Uh, you know, my personal feeling is that uh, Perot's witticisms and one-liners are a little studied and rehearsed and part of an image campaign. Rogers, I think, came by them 
a little more naturally. Uh, but still, there, there are a lot of similarities to, to Perot. You say uh, at some time during his life he didn't write his stuff, his column. Well, actually, that, that's a little misleading. Um, and the striking thing was just how much of it he did write, or how little of it he didn't write. Um, you know, these 20 volumes, I tried to figure out how many words, somewhere between two and three million words. Uh, basically, he wrote every one. The, what he didn't write were his movies. Uh, he made about 20 movies for the Fox, uh, later 20th Century Fox Company, between 1929 and 35, um, and they were done by screenwriters. And the only other uh, uh, example that I found, and I'm not conclusive on this, was I talked to Maury Amsterdam, who's, of course, the famous comedian on The Dick Van Dyke Show. Still alive? Still alive, as, as far as I know. I, when I talked to him, he was very much alive. Um, and he said that he met Will Rogers when he, Maury Amsterdam, was a 15 or 14-year-old cello player comedian, comedy cello player, on, again, a charity bill in Los Angeles in the early 30s. They got to... Uh, they got to be friends, got to talking, and that occasionally uh, Rogers would show Amsterdam one of his columns, say, what do you think about this? Amsterdam might suggest uh, an improvement, or occasionally he might submit a gag or two. Um, and that's, of course, Amsterdam's testimony. Uh, and I don't say it's true or not true, but that's just what, what he says. But that's the only indication that any word that was published under Rogers' name was, was not written by Rogers himself. When I was reading your book and talking about the fact that he had 40 million readers a day and that he had a lot of money that he was making, I think at one point before the Depression, 180 some thousand a movie. Right, that was, was his high for his film. Yeah, he was making, you know, close to half a million dollars a year. Um, and I, then I, it led to, to today trying to compare it with people you see today besides the one you mentioned. How would he fit in the Rush Limbaugh? Well, I, I kind of purposely left Rush Limbaugh out, although uh, there are parallels. I mean, uh, they were both incredibly popular commentators on a grassroots level. Uh, um, you know, I feel that Limbaugh... But was he as political as Limbaugh is today? As in content, absolutely. I mean, that was his main subject, and his calm was politics. Was he funny? He was funny. He was humane. He was never... Uh, mean-spirited, never bitter. He could be pointed and sharp, but one, the reason why he was so beloved was that his basic uh, uh, humaneness came through everything he wrote. You write about his visit to a dinner one night with Calvin Coolidge, and when the aide wrote a book later on, had some negative things to say about him. What was that about? Yeah, uh, the details uh, I'm, I'm not, are not that fresh memory, but, but when we'll, what the... Another, <laughs> So many things Will Rogers did, uh, the, the movies, the column, the uh, radio, he was, no, there were no ratings then, but he had a weekly show in the early 30s that was probably the second highest rated show after Amos and Andy in the country. Uh, it was on Sundays and churches reported uh, downturns in attendance when he was on. Uh, the other thing he did, and he sort of pioneered uh, in, the, in the late 20s, was the lecture circuit. He went on a uh, one-man show around the country, and it's sort of more common today, in fact, People like James Whitmore go on a one-man show, as Will Rogers. Uh, but he was one of the first to do that. Um, and he would go to six or seven cities a week and, and do a show. He'd just sit on the stage. Uh, well, he'd start off standing. Uh, the show would be two and a half, three hours long. At the end, he'd just be sitting on the end of the stage, dangling his legs and say, uh, go on home, I'm sick of looking at you, to the audience. But anyway, one of the, the sort of set pieces uh, and high points was uh, uh, the account of his night at the White House with Mr. and Mrs. Coolidge. He had been, he, after his trip to Europe in, in 1927, he had been invited to spend the night at the White House. Uh, and he gave this comic rendition of it, saying that he arrived and uh, the train had been delayed, and he was really impressed that Mr. and Mrs. Coolidge waited dinner for him, using that you know, colloquialism that they uh, delayed dinner for him, uh, just like any you know American household, and described some of the conversations they had, and uh, got a lot of comic mileage. A few years later, actually, probably uh, 15 or so years later, uh, the man who had been uh, uh, Coolidge's uh, sort of 
aide de camp, not aide de camp, but more of a butler or major domo at the White House, and for, was for many presidents, came out with a book. And Named he's, Hopkins. Was that his name? Hopkins, yeah. 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 Uh, and he said, well, no, they didn't wait dinner for Rogers. It was all uh, exaggerated. And he seemed <laughs> to still carry a chip on his shoulder after all those years. I think uh, Rogers was using a little poetic license in his description of the visit. In the back, uh, under the acknowledgments, you say, um, more than likely what drew me to write about a good man was having a good man for a father. Is yeah. That, that, how is that? Well, um, pretty much what I said. Uh, as, I, as I told you before, when I started off on Rogers, um, didn't know anything about him, just these uh, couple of quotations. Uh, as I got more and more into it, I was more and more fascinated. Um, on the one hand, just because of all the things he did and represented, uh, things about America, things about uh, the media culture of the 20th century, um, things about his, his, his background, having grown up in Indian Territory, quarter blood Cherokee, his father having uh, fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War, as many Cherokee did, uh, and then moving on through vaudeville, the Ziegfeld Follies, silent movies, the talking pictures, uh, you know, American humor, he just seemed to represent so much. So that was one of the things that excited me about the book. But another that, that kept me going with it, and that sort of was a, a bit of a deeper appeal, um, I also in the acknowledgments quote a line from one of Roger's best friends was the actor uh, Joel McRae, the, the who, movie actor who died actually about two or three years ago. I was not able to talk to him either. But he had, in another interview, had said uh, that there's a word for Will Rogers, that word is glory. He lent a little bit of glory to everything he touched. Uh, now this that's, is his family right here. That's right. That's uh, his, uh, his wife, Betty, his younger son, Jim. Uh, who's still alive, his, his older son, Bill. Jim and, on the far left? Yes. And then his daughter, Mary, who died uh, about four or five years ago. Uh, I, McCray said he, he lent a little glory to everything he touched. And, and you know, that's, that's a, a pretty big statement. But as I went through the book, researching it, reading his writings, you know, I got a sense of what he felt, that he was this uh, decent, humane, uh, good-hearted, good-spirited man that was... And there are a lot of people like that, my father being one. Uh, but what's rare is to being able to communicate that as well as he did to as incredibly wide an audience as he did. That, to me, is, is the real accomplishment of Will Rogers. He uh, didn't, he, he, he hated people who talked about uh, what Americanness was and what being a true blue American. Uh, he hated people who, who uh, posed and, and made uh, portentous statements about how great they were. But somehow, in his subtle way, he was able to communicate those values in just a masterful way. And uh, as I said in the book, I think one of the things that drew me to that was the example of my father, who uh, unfortunately died before the book came out. But he just had that same kind of decency. And he told me about remembering reading Will Rogers' columns you know, in the 20s and 30s, uh, and enjoying them at the time. Where was your father living when he died? In New York City. Uh, when he died, he was living in, in New Rochelle, New York, uh, where I grew up. But he was a young man in New York City at the time. Your mom's still alive? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Still live there? Uh, yes, New Rochelle. Now, where'd you go to school? I went to, uh, to high school and the public schools in New Rochelle, and then on to Horace Mann School in Bronx, New York, a private school. Uh, graduated from Yale uh, with a B.A., and I got a uh, master's degree in American Civilization from the University of Pennsylvania. What year did you get out of Yale? 76. And why did you study at the uh, University of Pennsylvania? What was the... Uh, well, um, I was, as I said before, I was a freelance journalist. And I, you probably talked to a few freelance journalists over the years and know a little bit about the, uh, the, the hardships of that endeavor. Uh, so at that time, I had the idea I had done teaching at Temple University on, on an adjunct basis. I said, I would like to do this full time. Uh, here's a way that I can continue my writing, but also have a steady, uh, uh, a steady position, support colleagues, uh, and, and being able to, to communicate what I know how to do uh, and maybe help out some young people. Uh, so it just occurred to me that the way to uh, pursue that goal would be to get an advanced degree. And so I did this late in life, not later in life, I should say. 
uh, and went to school part-time at the University of Pennsylvania, w uh, was able to defray a little of the cost because my wife is, works there at Penn. Um, still was expensive. Uh, and chose American Civilization just because, as you can tell from the book, that's where my interests lie. Uh, even though I plan to teach journalism, um, it seemed that I should get a degree in something that, that, uh, that really interested me. So that was, that was the story of that. What was your biggest uh, feeling about Will Rogers or surprise after the book was finished compared to what you thought going into it? Well, really, uh, and I found this out fairly soon after starting, how incredibly uh, famous and popular he was. Uh, I mean, it's a puzzling thing. He was, uh, I've, I've described, I think at some length, the position he had uh, at the time, and he was really at the height of his popularity when he died in 1935. Um, but there, there was I, growing up in the 60s, 70s, never hearing hardly anything about him, except when they came along in the movie theaters asking for donations. Uh, and it, it, I still puzzle over that a little bit. Um, Can you see his movies easily? Do they pop up on movie no, channels? No, no, and that's one of the reasons for it. Uh, and I don't know why this happened, but 20th Century Fox, which owned the rights to his movies, when television started buying up films in the, in the uh, 50s, 20th Century Fox didn't sell the Rogers films. And I don't know whether that was because TV wasn't interested or they didn't want to sell them or they were holding out for a better offer or what. So as a result, with the exception of one of his films, which went into the public domain, Judge Priest, uh, directed by John Ford, one of his best films, films were not shown on television at all. That's a big reason. Still aren't. Uh, no, uh, for the most part, yes. Uh, two or three years ago, Fox put out four of the films on video tape. Uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, which he was uh, made one of the versions of, uh, Mr. Skitch, and one or two others. Um, so they are now out there. The rest still aren't. Uh, another thing that happened was he died in 1935. Uh, he was so much a part of his times. You know, just from the fact that he, his comment every day was commenting on that day's events. But, but more than that, he was really a creature of his times. Um, all of a sudden, the world changed so rapidly. Uh, yeah, there you see him with, with his buddy uh, FDR at a, at a rally in 1932 on the far left was Roosevelt. And then his son, uh, I believe James, uh, Senator W.G. McAdoo from California, and James Farley, the Postmaster General, Will Rogers, cracking up FDR. Um, all of a sudden, things changed so much. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, World War II happened, and the revelations about the Holocaust and what was going on, the atomic bomb. It was just such a radically different world that uh, somehow Rogers didn't seem relevant anymore and, and became somewhat forgotten, certainly from those who hadn't experienced him. Uh, I thought it might be interesting to read a little bit of this telegram that uh, he sent FDR after his election. Mm. And was that the election in 32? Right, right. Uh, and if you've got it too, you can join in on this This. Uh, exercise, sure. Because it, uh, I know when I read it, 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 uh, it said a lot of things about what he thought. I guess what he thought about politics. Absolutely, uh, a little bit about politics, a lot about public relations. And uh, w when I read this uh, over the years, this telegram, which I think is a remarkable document, uh, it occurred to me more than once that Bill Clinton could use somebody to give him a telegram. Uh, well, like well you've got it there. Why don't you go ahead and read it? Yeah, sure. Uh, this, this, uh, he sent this uh, uh, several weeks after Roosevelt run, won in a, in a landslide, and Roosevelt was uh, at Warm Springs, Georgia, where he went for uh, the healing waters for his polio. Uh, and he sent him this telegram, and he said, uh, I didn't worry you, and, and stop me when, uh, if, I, if I go on too long here. He said, I didn't worry you on your election because I knew you wasn't reading any of them anyhow. Now that all the folks that want something are about through congratulating you, I thought maybe a wire just wishing you could do something for the country when you get in and not wishing anything for me. Well, I thought the novelty of a wire like that when it was backed up by the facts might not be unwelcome. Your health is the main thing. Don't worry too much. A smile in the White House again. By the way, when was the last one? Why, it will look, it will look like a meal to us. It's the biggest job in the world but you got the most help in the world to assist you. 
Pick you some good men. Make them responsible for their end. If Europe don't pay up, and that was about the debts from World War I that was still owed to us by European nations, well, fire your secretary of the treasurer and get one that will make them pay. If people are starving and your granaries are full, that's your secretary of agriculture's business, is to feed them. If Nicaragua, even then a hot spot, Nicaragua wants to hold an election, send them your best wishes, but no Marines. Disarm with the rest of the world, but not without it. And kid Congress and the Senate. Don't scold them. They are just children that's never grown up. They don't like to be corrected in company. Don't send message to, messages to them. Send candy. Let your Secretary of State burn up the notes that come from Europe. Don't you have to attend to a little thing like that? Europe's not going to do what they threaten to do. All those things are just something to give diplomats an excuse for existing. He said, keep off the radio till you got something to say, even if it's a year. Be good to the press boys in Washington, for they're getting those merry-go-rounds every few weeks now. Stay off of that back lawn with your photographers unless you got a Helen Wills, the tennis star, or your fifth cousin, Alice Roosevelt Longworth. Nothing will kill off interest in a president quicker than weeklies with chambers of commerces and women's political organizations. Now, if some guy comes running into your office telling you what Wall Street was doing that day, tell him, Wall Street? Why, there is 115 million of my subjects that don't know if Wall Street is a thoroughfare or a new mouthwash. Its happenings don't interest me. Why, Governor, you can go in there and have a good time. We want our president to have some fun. Too many of our presidents mistake the appointment as being to the Vatican and not to just another American home. A lot, of times, a, a lot of times you see misspelled words yeah. and some clumsy English. Oh, yeah. He, On purpose? Uh, well, yes, in the sense that he didn't know any better. In other words, he didn't affect it. It wasn't, uh, there was rumors that spread when Rogers was around that he was really had an Oxford education and was just putting on that cowboy pose. Not true. He never met, he, he never actually graduated from high school. His father, who, as I said, was a wealthy rancher, sent him to very good schools, but Will never got along with school, and he left school after, before graduation high school to become a cowboy, actually, in Texas. Um, so ne didn't have a lot of learning, never mastered punctuation, capitalization, spelling, nothing. And uh, early in his writing career, uh, copy editors would clean up that stuff, put in the correct spelling, correct punctuation, uh, until w wisely his editors said, no, don't do that. That's part of what makes Will Will. Um, so it was not a put on. Uh, later in his life, he got so fed up with capitalization that he got a typewriter that had only capital letters on it. So the question of a capital or lowercase letter would never come up. But it wasn't an act. That was him. Mussolini. Mussolini. Uh, that was Will Rogers' probably biggest bad call. Um, uh, when he toured Europe in 1927, he had a meeting with Mussolini. And he, even then, Mussolini was a controversial character. He wasn't uh, as... Uh, uh, it, it wasn't as clear that he was a uh, uh, a force for 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 evil in the world as it later became. He's still controversial. He had usurped some of the powers and become on his way to become a dictator. What's this picture right here? Uh, that is a uh, photograph that that Mussolini inscribed to Will Rogers. It's of of Mussolini uh, horse horseback riding, jumping over uh, uh, a bar. And it says, Al Signor Rogers, to Signor Rogers, complimenti, uh, compliments of Mussolini, 28th Maggio of May 1926. Um, but Rogers, uh, to me, to my mind, one of his weak spots was that he, uh, uh, he had a, a, a kind of liking for dictators. Uh, he, he had one quote to the effect that is, as, uh, as long as the dictator makes the right decision, there's nothing wrong with him. Well, you know, to our ears today, that sounds like really off the mark. Um, and I think that was a legitimate uh, criticism I have of Rogers. One of the reasons why he liked FDR so much was his strong uh, presidency. Uh, he, you know, he tried to take powers away from Congress. Rogers liked that. Uh, he, he just didn't like Congress. He didn't like the, the endless posturing, debates back and forth. Uh, a lot of his criticisms were well taken, but I think he, an, an example of 
as a commentator, he often went back and forth between wanting to be taken seriously, take positions on issues of the day, and almost retreating into comedy, uh, making statements almost tantamount to, well, just kidding. Uh, he never really wanted to go out in a limb, except in rare instances. When the Depression happened, that was one of them. He was so outraged by that that he felt government should take action. For the most part, he would often retreat to comedy. And his comments about dictators, about Mussolini, is an example of that, where he didn't really want to follow through. He wanted that safety net of being a comedian and a humorist. Did he ever consider behind the scenes running for office? Really? Absolutely not. Never? No. Uh, certainly not that I found any instances of. His son, Will Rogers, Jr., ran what year, do you remember? Uh, I believe he uh, was, ran in 42. How long was 40 it? 40 or 42. 40 it was. In 42, we were in the war. He did not run for your election and enlisted in the armed services. After the war, he ran in the Democratic primary for Senate in California. The seat, I believe, that Richard Nixon eventually won. Will Rogers Jr. lost in the primary, so didn't didn't get to uh, run for. Senate. I'm confused with the images of James Whitmore and Will Rogers Jr. and Will Rogers. But did I see growing up Will Rogers Jr. on television? Yes. Doing what? Well, he's done a lot of things. He was a commercial spokesman. Um, he was the first host of the program that CBS put on as a competitor to the Today Show. In the mid 50s, mid 1950s, Today Show had been popular on NBC. CBS started one, which now they, they have still, but intermittently has been on the air. He was he was the host of it. He also, for a period in the 70s, worked in the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington as a as a statesman. So he did a, a lot of different things. Now, uh, Claymore, Oklahoma, where right. is it? It is uh, about 20 miles outside of Tulsa. And what's the facility look like if somebody were to go there and visit? Can they get well, it? Oh, absolutely. It's one of the, uh, the most popular tourist attractions in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, thousands and thousands of people. It's a wonderful museum with uh, memorabilia from Roger's career. They show these movies. They have the videos of them that can't be seen anywhere else. There's dioramas and posters from his, his movie career. And there's a recreation of his office, the way it looked that he worked at in, in California. How popular is the place? Very popular. In the peak of the summer, hundreds and hundreds of people come in every day. Uh, the other place that's open to the public is his ranch. He called it his ranch. Uh, uh, he wrote in his column once, we call it a ranch. Uh, it isn't really one, but that don't do any harm uh, to call it that. Where he lived in Pacific Palisades, California, near Santa Monica, uh, that because after Will Rogers died, most of his money, pretty much all of it, he put into real estate, much of it mortgaged, a lot of taxes. Um, when he died, that income was cut off, and though, although he did have life insurance, it left his family with having to uh, pay those taxes, pay those mortgage payments. This photo is of, uh, is this the... No, that's not it, actually. That's not it? That's, that's a... his previous home in Beverly Hills. That was his first home in California. Um, there's a couple of shots of the, of the Santa Monica place in the book. Um, but when he, he died, his, his wife, his widow, and his family had to pay the, uh, uh, the upkeep, mortgages and taxes, and didn't have the resources to do it. So uh, they made an arrangement that after Mrs. Rogers' death, it would be donated to the state of California as a state park. And it's been kept up and restored exactly as it was when the Rogers family lived there. And it's just a beautiful uh, location. Yeah, that, that's just some shots of it. The top is the, uh, the living room with that picture window that was donated by Flo Ziegfeld, uh, Will Rogers' old boss in the Ziegfeld Follies. How do you donate a picture window? <laughs> uh, donate is probably the wrong word. He paid to have it installed and built. Uh, he, he, the, there was no picture window at first, and Flo Ziegfeld was, was visiting and said, you have this beautiful view, you have to have a window, I'm going to pay to have a window installed. This photograph right here we showed earlier um, seemed to me a lot of what you wrote about uh, you know, exemplifies the way he wrote his columns. That's right. That's uh, his, his old, uh, I forget what kind of LaSalle. column it was. LaSalle, exactly. Uh, he would drive to the movie studio, that was his job then, making movies. He would go to Fox every day, but before he could do his scenes, he had to write out his daily column that was due every day. It was due at the Western Union office at 2 o'clock. So shooting could not start 
till uh, Will Rogers had done his column for the day, and he would just, they gave him this uh, fancy dressing room in the Southwestern motif. It was more than a dressing room, it was a, uh, it was a, a bungalow. And in fact, it still exists, uh, not, not to digress from a digression, but I was on a talk show uh, in California, and I was talking about this bungalow he had, beautiful Southwestern style that he spent no time in. Somebody called up on this call-in radio show and said, I'm sitting in it right now. It's now still on the Fox set. It's the production center for The Simpsons. <laughs> so, so Will Rogers' former dressing room was still around, now being used for The Simpsons. Now, what's your reaction to the reaction to the book originally? I mean, you've had a year now to, to see how this book uh, did. Uh, very heartening. I mean, uh, uh, people... One of the things that, that I found is, is, and I didn't realize it, um, and although I said uh, my father had, had read Will Rogers, I only found that out uh, after I started talking about doing the book. Um, he, we, he didn't talk about much as I was growing up, but many people who were in the age of, of well, 30s to, up to 50s came from families where Will Rogers was revered, uh, even though these people now didn't remember him, they were very young or hadn't been born yet when he died, they remembered it. And now when this book came out, they wanted to find out about him. They were still remembered all the talk about Will Rogers from when they were kids. And then older people, people who were, say, uh, uh, 70 and up, they remember Will Rogers personally. They remember him on the radio and the movies. And it's been fascinating talking to them, uh, uh, you know, about their reactions to the book and, and their memories of Rogers. Can you tell us how many uh, hardback sold? Yeah, approximately 16,000 were sold. And how's the paperback doing? Well, it's actually being released just as we speak, so... Uh, What's it cost? It cost $14. Do you expect a better sale of the paperback than the hardback? You know, Brian, I don't know how that works. I figure that uh, it's about half the price, so that that'll induce more people. Uh, however, the real Will Rogers fans probably went out and bought the, the hardback. And the hardback's still in the bookstores. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it is. Is it? Okay. What I'm holding well, good. the bookstore. Good. Good. Uh, <laughs> so I need a fancy spreadsheet to, to plug in those things. But my guess is it'll be probably about the same, would be my guess. Yeah, page 286 in the hardback, um, I wrote down political philosophy because it seems to be a whole page, one thing after another, about what he stood for back then. Pro-income tax and anti-tariff. He doggedly stuck up for the farmers uh, whom he correctly saw as getting the blunt end of Republican economic policies of the 20s. Right. Uh, he, you know, it, it's a little hard, it was a little hard to extract, but he had a fairly coherent political philosophy. You know, I called it uh, a Neo-Jeffersonian because it was in favor of the farmers. Uh, What's anti-bunk? Anti-bunk? Well, that means just against, you know what bunk is. Well, yeah, but wasn't that his oh, political, that was his party. political party? In, in, in 1928, <laughs> when, they, when they ran him as a gag, it was the anti-bunk party. Um, and he was a populist. He distrusted big business. He distrusted Wall Street, as I said before. He, he hated speculation of any kind. Um, Didn't, did, he felt, uh, I'm reading from what you said, consumer buying on credit and stock market speculation, both of which reached unprecedented proportions by the end of the decade, were something close to an evil, and he correctly felt would end in disaster? Right. Well, you know, all through the 20s, he was talking about stock market speculation was a bad thing, uh, the credit uh, was a bad thing, and he was looking at that not as a real economic thinker, but as sort of his moral philosophy. He didn't like the idea of speculation. And... You know, the stock market crashed. The Depression came, seeming to prove him right. Uh, his efficacy, I'm sorry, his sp uh, skepticism about the efficacy of the League of Nations, the World Court, and the succession of international conferences held in the 20s and 30s qualified him as an isolationist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was an isolationist. Um, uh, unlike other people called isolationists, he really was consistent. I mean, he opposed U.S. military intervention in Nicaragua, uh, places like that, as well as being anti-League of Nations. It's interesting to speculate what he would have, uh, position he would have taken as the, into the late 30s and early 40s as World War II was starting to brew. Uh, I really wouldn't even hazard a guess. What about your, and you start right off in the beginning about the, there's two fam most famous comments, uh, yeah. that uh, uh, all I know is what I read in the papers and I never met a man I didn't like, is that true? And where did he say that? Okay. Uh, 
both of them he said many times. In fact, even when he was alive, they were his trademarks. Uh, the folks at the Will Rogers Memorial, Pat Lowe, the librarian there, uh, has come up with a list of eight occasions where he said, a variant of I never met a man I didn't like. Uh, all I know is, is, actually the way he phrased it was, all I know is just what I read in the papers, which isn't grammatical, but is a little bit more effective. Um, that was his, uh, uh, he, he wrote an early newspaper, col uh, early magazine column for life, uh, was the heading for it, and then later in his weekly column, he would start off every column with that sentence and then go on for that. That's a little easier to discuss. That was an exaggeration, but not much of one. He read about 10 newspapers a day. He loved newspapers. He would go through one after another. Uh, didn't care for books. Uh, he said uh, too many adjectives. You know. uh, uh, but he loved newspapers, and it was just a way of, of, of sort of a declaration of intellectual modesty. You know, he, he's not going to put on airs. On the I never met a man I, I, I didn't like, um, you said that that came out, the first time he said it was a meeting with Leon Trotsky? That's right. Or around that meeting? Yeah. He, uh, on his tour of Russia, I guess it was 1926, he uh, tried to meet Trotsky, which was, who was the figure after Lenin's death, who was most famous to Americans. Although he said that he heard that a, a bird from the Caucasus named Stalin was really running the show. Uh, but he tried to meet Trotsky and was not allowed to do it. And he said, well, I wish they, they had because I've talked to all people in public life all my life and I've never met one that I didn't like. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out what he meant by that because it was certainly not true. It was not literally true. There, there were people he didn't like. Partly it was hyperbole. Um, Who didn't he like? Do you, do you remember? Well, Warren G. Harding, for one. Uh, didn't like him personally? Or? Yeah, well, yeah. They, they, uh, not that he was uh, associated with that much, but uh, Harding stood him up. He was supposed to come see a show that Rogers gave, and he, he didn't come uh, because he was miffed at some comments Rogers had made uh, uh, about him in a previous night's show and in his column. And uh, when Harding wasn't there, Rogers addressed the audience and said, well, I've never met a big man who couldn't take a joke on himself. Not mentioning Harding, but uh, making it perfectly clear who he met. Uh, what about the, I don't know if you remember the Harold Ickes story? I mean, this is the same right. father of the Harold Ickes that's in the White House That's now. right, the father who was the interior secretary under Roosevelt. Uh, I don't think Rogers had anything against Ickes, but he had a problem with uh, spelling, as we said, also pronunciation. And there was a dam then called Ickes Dam being built. Uh, Rogers called it Ikey's Dam, and apparently Harold Ickey's couldn't stand it. He blew up when he heard his name mispronounced that way, and I, I came upon an oral history that one of his aides gave and said that when Ickey's heard that, he just blew up and wouldn't have anything to do with Rogers ever again for the rest of his life. You got another book in mind? I have a few. Uh, none have been crystallized. As I said, uh, you know, I, I, I feel that I found such a wonderful subject here. Uh, I, I, I haven't been able to find one that lives up to it. And then again, one of the reasons why it took me so long to find this, all the good subjects have been taken, it sometimes seems. So it, it's been tough finding another one, but I'll, I'll be there. Um, what would Will Rogers be like today in this society, and what can you learn from what you learned about him for today's modern writer, politician, yeah. personality? That's a tough one. That, that really is. I hope you've saved that for last, because that's... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You mean you hope we run out of time? Yeah, right. <laughs> Cut me off right in the middle as I'm, as I'm stumbling around here. But um, it, I, I hope this isn't a cop out, but I think that question is not answerable, at least the first part. What would it be like today? Because I feel the times are so different. You know, you read that list of people uh, Clark Kiffer, Johnny Carson, Bill Cosby, Walter Cronkite that I said would have to be a combination to be Will Rogers today. Um, part of that was because he was such a remarkable person that he did so many things. Part of that is that the times have changed so much. Uh, the 20s and 30s were the last time when someone could adopt that many roles. The society is fragmented today. Uh, so if someone, you know, Michael Jackson is a, is a, is a record star, uh, well, that's what he does. And occasionally you might cross over to an, one other medium. but. Rogers was the, he was, Michael Jackson's the king of pop, Rogers was the king of movies, the king of newspapers, the king of radio, the king of the lecture tour, the king of politics. Uh, uh, it just couldn't happen today. 
You dedicate this book for William Van Rogers and for Gigi. Gigi is my wife, and uh, uh, she deserves uh, that dedication. William Van Rogers is uh, was the man known as Will Rogers Jr. It wasn't technically Will Rogers Jr. because Will Rogers Sr. had a different middle name. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's interesting that you should mention that now because it ties in with that other point. Uh, Will Rogers Sr. was such a remarkable person. In, in a very odd way, his three children each inherited a different aspect of him. Uh, his daughter was an actress, was on the stage. Um, his son Jim loved horses, uh, as Will Rogers did, and became a rancher. Son Bill inherited uh, several things. Interest in politics, interest in writing and literature. He was a great appreciator of literature. And also a real decency and, and, and goodness. And that was why I dedicated the book to him. Uh, uh, he just, he carried, and Jim too, the two of them really carry that torch of Will Rogers uh, beyond in a way that was, that was very inspiring to me. So unfortunately, as I said, he died before the book came out. By the way, where did you write the book? In, up in my office, in my home, hunkered down behind my computer. What time of day do you like to write? Well, it's not a question of preference because I have these two kids that kind of squeeze the two ends. So I, How old? Uh, now three and six. But as the book was being written, you know, three and zero, four and one, and so on. Uh, I have it, you know, I squeeze uh, four, five, six hours in the middle of the day, uh, you know, nine to, to nine or ten to four, something like on that. On the scale of easy to hard, where do you come in on that uh, for writing itself? Uh, for, for this book, how hard? Just, just you, you as a writer, is it easy for you to write or hard? It depends on what I'm doing. This book was, I wouldn't say it was easy, but the, once I got the material, it was so good. And the structure, which I find usually the hardest thing of writing, the broader structure was there. It was the chronology of his life. I mean, if I had finished writing by 1912, so, oh God, what do I do now? Well, 1913, it's right there, you know. Uh, and I tried not to juice, just do it, and then this happened, and then that happened. But the chronology was, was built there. So I would come up, and I'd see where I stopped the day before, and I would try to advance the story a little bit and uh, make it readable and try to provide some insights about what was going on in the culture. But uh, it was not, it was not uh, like Red Smith said about writing, you know, opening a vein and letting the blood out. It was, it was more pleasant than that. This is what the cover of the book looks like, at least the hardback version. Will Rogers is the biography, and our guest has been Ben Yagoda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.